NASA is going to be putting people on the moon in 2024. Um, the last time we actually had people on the moon was December 14th, 1972. And if you remember from that 1961 JFK speech, he said, but why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, it was 35 years ago then, but now it's 95 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Because it's there and we're going to climb it. And in July 20th, 1969, we actually successfully got people on the moon with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin being the first two people to walk on the moon. The problem with those reasons is they lead to this type of thinking, been there, done that. And in fact, April 15th, 2010, when President Obama was outlaying his uh, NASA space policy, he says, now I understand that some believe that we should attempt to return to the surface of the moon first as previously planned. But I just have to say pretty bluntly here, we've been there before, Buzz has been there before. There's a lot more of space to explore and a lot more to learn when we do. And while Obama was right that there's a lot more to learn in space, I don't think we're quite done with the moon yet. But why go back is a legitimate question. What do we hope to achieve? And first of all, we have some social goals. We had 12 people walk on the moon. And you may notice uh, something about those 12. They're all very similar uh, to each other. And why these were very exceptional people, uh, they don't necessarily represent all of us. And if you look at the Artemis astronaut core, we have nine men, nine women, and people from a diverse set of backgrounds, people that little kids can look to and see themselves in. But we also have national goals. This is not just a little made up photo. This is actually the Chinese flag that was planted on the moon by the most recent loon, uh, moon lander. Now, I'm not against uh, flag planning. The US has planted uh, six flags on the moon itself. But the point is, China is going to the moon. Other countries are going to the moon. And it's those countries that actually go that are going to set the rules and set uh, the normal operating procedures for these places. And the US needs to be a part of that as well. And in order for us to be there, we need to go. And of course, there's science goals as well. These are the Artemis uh, science goals. Uh, the second one here, looking at the lunar polar uh, volatiles. These are resources um, on the moon that can help further um, space exploration. And we should learn about where they come from, came from, how much of them there are, and how we can use them. The third reason here, uh, the interpreting the impact history of the Earth-Moon system is something very important as well. Meteors are constantly hitting the Earth. Every night, uh, for every hour, on a clear sky, you can see at least one meteor streaking by. And this is happening all the time. Most of them are very small and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. And those that do make it through the Earth's atmosphere usually end up in the ocean since water covers the majority surface of the Earth. And then those that do actually make an impact on land don't stay visible for long because weathering and ecological events help to cause it to blend in. This is not true with the moon. Every meteor that hits the moon or goes towards the moon doesn't burn up in the atmosphere because there is no atmosphere. It doesn't get weather over. And so the moon provides a historical record of the moon earth space over millions and millions of years. And so there could be dangers, uh, orbital debris that's on um, you know, 1,000, 10,000 year orbits that the moon might have a really good record of and we could repair and avoid. Um, and then also observing the universe and local space environment from a unique location is another really key reason. How much scientific insight came from a gut feeling or a flash of insight? And the majority of people on Earth have the same physical experience, 24 hour a day, one atmosphere of pressure, one G of gravity. How, what kind of insights will we get whenever we actually start having humans observe the universe from you know, a 28 hour day with one seventh gravity, with completely artificial uh, pressure? So those are some science reasons to go. But I think ultimately they all missed the point 
uh, ultimately it comes down to a choice about our future. Is that future with all of life that we know about, all consciousness and everything, only staying on the earth and eventually dying with the earth? Or is our future basis on the moon, cities on Mars, giant habitable structures that allow for us to live throughout the, the solar system? Is it uh, facilities on the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, and ultimately being able to make it to other star systems and expand throughout the galaxy and maybe throughout the universe? And so we choose to go to the moon and do the other things. And that's the vision of the National Space Society, people living and working in thriving communities beyond the earth and the use of the vast resources of space for the dramatic betterment of humanity, both here on earth and wherever it may go. And so if you haven't done so already, please join us, northhoustonspace.org, sign up for our email list so we could stay in contact, join the National Space Society, connect with others that share this vision, and help educate and inspire communities about what is possible, and let's make it happen. So with that, I want to welcome you to the North Houston Space Society December 12th meeting. A couple of housekeeping things. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube, our website, Facebook, and other places. Uh, you can turn on and off your video uh, down here through the Zoom um, uh, menu. And today, uh, we're going to have um, a fairly packed agenda. We're going to start off with um, Adam Hawkins giving his third space communicator speech. Then we'll have Greg Stanley uh, go over recent space news. And there has been so much space news since our last meeting. Uh, and then Eagle Sermont is going to go over our future in space through a, a guided discussion. And I uh, hope you can, uh, will participate in that. And we'll, that, of course, will include some Q&A. So those two kind of both merge together. And then towards the end, we have a couple of things to share. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to help out uh, with the science fair. Uh, so um, Heather is going to tell us a little bit more about that. And then we'll try to wrap up everything at four. So with that, um, let me turn it over uh, to you, Adam. All right, is my mic working? Uh, yes, uh, sounds good. Do I need to share my screen or? Uh, yes, I think that would be best. Sorry, you know, I got a little preview of everything that's going on. But today I'm talking about a technical topic and the topic I decided to choose was CO2 scrubbing and recycling. A little disclaimer is prior researching this topic, I had minimal to none knowledge. I knew what it was, but didn't really have any details or what it could be used for and the importance of it. So moving on. What is CO2 scrubbing? A CO2 scrubber is a piece of equipment that basically removes CO2 from the air. And the purpose of the CO2 system is to make the air breathable, remove the CO2 and bring back oxygen into the system. This is typically done through a process which contains lithium hyd hydroxide canisters that use molecular seas to absorb the CO2 and combine it with potassium bicarbonate or potassium superoxide to form potassium bicarbonate and pure oxygen. Why is CO2 scrubbing important? Well, if you don't CO2 scrub and let the CO2 build up gradually through breathing air, you breathe in O2 and you exhaust out CO2. So over time, the CO2 concentrations will build up in the air. And at the various percentages of concentration, you receive different side effects with 8% being where you have death. And so we, it's very important that we, when we're focusing on long-term space missions, deep space, and just making sure that we have the capability to, to remove the CO2 from the air or else it's gonna be a greater challenge in order to survive and have long duration missions. On Earth, Plants help remove the carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So today, the space station itself has the ability to remove 
or recover about 42% oxygen from the CO2, and they recover about 90% water through recycling efforts. And their, their components are only slated to, they, they're happy if they last six months and they can perform regular maintenance with ease since it's so easy to go up and basically resupply the space station. Whereas in deep space, you're not gonna have any support that's readily available to you. So in deep space, you need a reliable system that can last at least 30 months. About three years would be the first Mars mission that people would have to survive for about three years in order to uh, make the trip back. And so in future of deep space, you'll need at least 75% O2 recovery from the CO2 and you need to be able to recycle water at about a 98% rate. So who's currently working on CO2 scrubbing? Well, Dynetics is, has a, their environmental control and life support systems and it'll result in a dramatic leap forward for habitats habitat in deep space for the use of removing CO2 scrubbing. The benefits of this CO2 scrubber that they're working on is to perform a highly reliable, continuous CO2 scrubbing in spacecraft and where they can preserve the water molecules. The current system requires consumable resupply and substantial maintenance and it also consumes more power. So they wanna reduce all those things to make it a more reliable system and to consume less power since all aspects of living in space, it's just getting supplies up there. It's, it's difficult to be able to produce power and you wanna conserve as much as possible. So the Dynamics project is to develop a miniaturized system designed for infrequent maintenance that requires minimal astronaut interaction in order to maintain it. The system minimizes consumables, it minimizes weight, minimizes size, and it minimizes power. All of this while maximizing CO2 removal. So CO2 recycling. Why is CO2 recycling important? Well, apart from its negative effects here on Earth, CO2 is also a valuable resource which can be combined through various processes to with various elements in order to create useful byproducts. By adding electricity, water, and variety of catalysts, scientists can re recover uh, CO2 into short molecules such as carbon monoxide and methane, and they can combine those to form more complex hydrocarbon fuels like butane. So researchers are, have been constantly working on CO2 recycling. They've implemented a few of these technologies in like oil and gas plants where they capture the CO2 and use that CO2 uh, to create byproducts that can be reused and reduce the emissions on, here on Earth. And it will also be important in deep space missions to be able to recycle and create byproducts that we would be able to use. So CO2 recycling, is, the basis of it is to mimic nature. The idea stems from artificial photosynthesis, whereas nature has been able to take light, CO2, and water to create food. We're looking at ways of engineering devices in order to take all these substances, CO2, renewable water, and reduce that into more value-added products that we can use during our deep space missions. So some various topics, hey, bringing in algae and using vertical farming to raise algae and various uses that algae can be used for is since like any other plant, algae, when grown using sunlight, they consume CO2 as they grow. And the more CO2, the higher productivity of the algae plant itself. And while it absorbs the CO2, it then emits O2. So you're basically uh, scrubbing the CO2 and releasing O2 and being able to recycle the o oxygen component of it. So some of the uses of algae is food supplementation. You can create plastics, lubricants, fertilizers, cosmetics, biofuels, natural oils, and there's plenty more uses that can be used from the product with most notably food supplementation would probably be the biggest use in this environment. And so 
at, that ends my topic on the technical space. And then I'll go into talking about where I'm at now and give you all a little update on where I'm, what I'm doing at Blue Origin and what Blue Origin is doing. So I'm located in Huntsville, Alabama, also known as Rocket City. And here in Alabama, we are creating a 350,000 square foot high capacity production facility for the B4 and B3U engine production. And the shell of the building opened doors in February 2020, so we're still relatively young. And by shell, that's strictly just walls and nothing within the interior. So the plan is to have dozens of BE4 and BE3U engines that will be produced every year. It provides 300 plus jobs to the local economy. It's looking more like it'll hit around 400 by the end of everything. And this facility has a 200 million investment from Blue Origin's founder Bezos. And he has a, he's a big believer in moving away from R&D and into production. And that's what this building is gonna be used for. Here in Huntsville, we also have the Marshall Space Flight Center test stand. So we are repurposing test stand 4670, which was used in the Apollo era as a test stand for all of the engines back then. And so we're repurposing it. We're gonna be using it for a B4 and B3U test stand. So we're keeping the history alive. So my role at Blue Origin, so I'm currently acting as the construction program manager. Everyone in the building basically knows who I am. They come to me for anything that they need. And so I'm managing two project managers and a construction manager in order to get things done. I also have about 40 subcontractor personnel at any given day and we're moving. And so all construction related activities go through me. So whether it be civil, structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, rigging, whatever is needed, once a machine or technology or equipment arrives, I handle it, I, I offload it from the trucks, I bring it in the building, make sure everything's hooked up, ready to go. And then once it has power and gas and everything that it needs, I hand it over to another project manager for equipment activation. And so upon construction completion, I'll be transitioning into a project, a manufacturing project manager, which I'll be working on improving processes so we can crank out more engines in a, a same duration of time. So at peak, we're looking at probably like 30 plus engines in the factory a year. And we're, we're looking for ways to increase it, utilizing lean and Kaizen techniques. And on that, I have some pictures of the NS-13 badge that I received for our NS-13 test flight that happened about a month ago. And then our first chip that was on the main combustion chamber engine of the first engine that's gonna be coming out of Huntsville. And so they gave us a little thing showing that we're now in production mode, making engines, even though construction is still ongoing. And that ends my presentation. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. Yeah, Adam, um, that's really good. I'm gonna go ahead and allow people to unmute themselves. I actually recognize every name in the room. So that's uh, pretty good. I, I should uh, say a little bit about the Space Communicator Program. So this is your third speech. Uh, the Space Communicator Program um, is meant to try to get people to uh, put together a presentation and and get them comfortable talking in front of a group. And there's three types of presentations that you have to do. The personal space speech, which if I remember right, I think you did in like January or February, really early this year. Yeah, um, I did that back in February and March are my first two speeches. And yeah, and, and then in March, I think you did the uh, community space speech and then uh, this is the, the technical one. And uh, with that, you've completed all the requirements for um, your uh, space communicator thing. So I wanted to give you a trophy uh, and anyway. Yeah, I can go get that trophy if you want. I no, that's okay. This meeting that is in the other room right now. So I, I met up with Nathan over the Thanksgiving holidays to pick it up and I was gonna present it, but I don't currently have it in my office currently, so. You need to do one of these things with your hands where one guy, you know, comes in the other side, looks like you hand it off. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good. The thing is, I'm not sure the uh, layout of everybody's picture is the same on all the screens. So it, it would look right for somebody, but that would be really cool. 
I, does anybody have a question for Adam? Um, I do. Okay, well, thanks, Adam. Uh, that's awesome. And it's great to know the job you're doing. That's fantastic. So uh, my question is, I've wondered, <clears throat> and I haven't found this anywhere, suppose you wanted to have a self-sustaining biosphere with people and plants. Let's say it was just one person. How many trees, you know, what kind of land mass of plants and vegetation would you need to have an equal carbon dioxide oxygen balance between to offset the two? That's a good question. I haven't gone into that much detail in my research, so I don't actually have a good answer for you. But I, I, I know when you're talking like O'Neill cylinders, you're going to have a large area of land mass that is not used for living purposes, for various outdoors, trees, farming, all that type of stuff. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we just wanted a purely natural solution, right? What would it take? I don't know. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if there has been too much research on the equilibrium aspect of what you would need as far as living versus uh, nature and production rates. So I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer on okay. that. I thought you might have found that in your research, but okay. We do have a person on the call that was involved with a project that was really dependent upon the answer to that question. Uh, Greg, I, I was wondering if you had some thoughts. Yeah, I don't remember the numbers. I mean, for Biosphere 2, the project out there in Arizona, they had eight people in it. And the, the, the footprint was about three, a little over three acres, but one acres. But that when there were two levels there, there was a machinery level underneath, and then a level with all the, you know, the trees and you know, little ponds and, and and agriculture and so on. So I mean, it's a pretty massive undertaking. It does take a large. If you're going purely natural, there's no such thing as purely natural. Um, you're still going to need energy you know, brought in one way or another, but. Um, you know, for instance, if you're in a greenhouse, you're either going to have to remove heat or add heat depending on the outside conditions. So, you know, one way or another, you're going to need energy. But, you know, that gives you some idea. It's pretty, pretty large scale. I think it was something like 100 times the volume of the space station or maybe a couple hundred times the volume of the space station. When you start getting when you start getting into settlements, you probably want to have some diversity and different techniques being used. That way you'd have some uh, resilience of the architecture. I can add something to this too. I mean, I have worked on greenhouse for outer space. Uh, so as far as I have uh, researched, each person needs 124 cubic meter uh, of greenhouse to survive uh, with 100% uh, food support. So that is the bare minimum amount of greenhouse that each person needs. But that would be too much uh, CO2 production if that person wants to live in that space. So uh, I think these are two different separate factors that the, the green space that we need to survive with food support and the, the, the space that can hold the CO2 that we can breathe. And technology is always advancing, so some of these numbers can be reduced as time goes on and someone really puts their head to thinking about what solutions in order to minimize and maximize the situation. True. The, the projects that I have done is on uh, non-GMO plants, so with the um, uh, technology and the uh, genetically modified even potatoes, tomatoes, or something like these, uh, yes, the, the amount of volume will shrink in a couple of years. That's cool to hear. Anyone else have any questions for me? Yes, I have a question. Adam. Yeah, go ahead. Are you reporting from Huntsville? I'm sorry, what was that? Are you working in Huntsville, Alabama? Yeah, I'm in Huntsville currently. Do you have any openings at our virtual uh, positions? Sorry, your mic is breaking out for me. Uh, yes, if there are any openings for virtual positions. Uh, so we do have some people working from home and remotely, but I don't know how many positions or how to determine which position would undertake that. So because of COVID, they're being really 
lenient as far as working from home. We still have a lot of people that are staying from home and even like engineering and test positions and just coming up with procedures and all that. They're having some people like where they would normally relocate them to the facility, just let them stay where they currently were. So it's it's probably a yes and no. There there may be something that's permanent, but as of right now, it's it's strictly temporary due to COVID as far as not having people in the office. And yeah. so we're currently in like level four lockdown where only essential personnel are inside the building and anyone who can work from home does work from home. And yeah. so since I'm in construction, it's, it's hard to do a little bit of construction from home. So I'm one of the guys that goes in. Do you have a website to apply? I'm sorry? Do you have a website to apply for applications? So blueorigin.com, you can go there and you can look and you should be able to see all the open job listings. If you see something that you're interested in and you're remotely qualified for, whether it's as long as you hit a few of the items, you can reach out to me and I can also look into it and get you in contact with who would probably be looking for that area and try to help you further progress in the job process. Your, your main launch facility is in, in, uh, in West Texas. Do you ever make it there and watch some of the rocket launches? So I, I've only seen the Seattle campus and the Huntsville campus. My goal is to convince my company to let me spend some time down in West Texas when I go and visit my in-laws that live in El Paso. So I'm going to try and when I take time off to have them give me access for a couple of days so I can go see what they're doing over there. Okay, good. good, thank you. Well, good deal. Thank you so much, Adam. And if you think of any other questions, there should be time at the end of it. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Masa, for that um, tidbit about the, um, the amount of greenhouse. That's a really important stat to have as we look at uh, kind of branching out. Well, uh, with that, uh, Greg, you want to go ahead and go over the recent space news? All right, give me a second to get my screen shared. Uh, this one it looks like. Okay. You should have the full slide view there. Okay, well, we'll get started. Um, first of all, we, we've often started off with news about the moon, and this time we're going to look at it from a Chinese perspective because they're in the news lately. Um, they have a whole lunar space program, and, and I'll probably mispronounce this badly, um, named after a Chinese moon goddess from their folklore uh, called uh, Chang. And um, this is what she looked like on the left-hand side back in the Ming Dynasty, maybe 1500. And this is what she looks like now. But apparently there's a standard image called Chang'e flies to the moon. Um, it's often seen on packages of uh, pastries called moon cakes, which are used during a moon festival. Um, but to get into the serious side here, um, their big mission, which is the fifth in the series, um, is actually returning a sample. It's kind of as we speak, it's, it's happening. Um, so I'll just go over this thing. Um, the, the big picture is they're going to bring back a couple of kilograms of lunar rock and dirt. Um, and this is the first time anything's come back from the moon since 1976 with Russia's Lunar 24. Um, if you look at this, it's pretty much like uh, the way Apollo was done. That is, you have an orbiter, you have a lander and a sender that takes back off to meet with the orbiter again and so on. Um, so it's pretty much like Apollo, except the whole thing is completely robotic. So, you know, that simplifies it in some ways, don't have to worry about life support. Their target area is a little bit different. It's in a, an area called the Ocean of Storms, and inside of that, there's a volcanic mound. In a particular, its age is thought to be a whole lot less than the area where the Apollo samples were taken. So it should, really, should yield some different kinds of interesting information. This is, in fact, their third soft landing on the moon. Um, only three countries now have managed that. That's the US, Russia, and China. Um, this also will be the first takeoff of a spacecraft from a large planetary body since 1976, again, that same Russian mission. It also will be the first robotic docking between two craft orbiting the moon. Um, it was about, the whole craft was about 18,000 pounds when launched. So 
the, the, the lower left-hand corner here, you can see kind of what it looked like. The, the orbiter is the lower part of this. The um, the ascend or the lander is kind of the middle part, and the um, the ascender is the upper part. So when they're on the surface of the lower right corner of the picture here, you see the lander is spread out, and here's a picture of the ascender taking off. So when they take samples, they have all these. They have robot arms for scooping uh, soil samples or dirt samples, and um, they also have drills to drill down about six, a couple meters. Anyway, it looks like this when it's taking off. And then, oh, and then return. This is the orbit and there's a small capsule uh, that's called the return capsule. It's just this little center part here. Um, that just basically gets shot back into the atmosphere. It bounces off of it once and finally comes to a landing. In fact, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because this is spelled out here in the milestones. Um, so let's just go through them. Um, it was launched back on November 23rd. It entered a moon orbit on the 28th. It um, they began the descent of the lander and the sender combination around November 30th, landed on the moon on December 1st. They took samples. As I said, they drilled them down about two meters, six feet. And they also scooped samples using robotic arms. So they had several different kinds of samples. And of course they, they took you know, various other electronic sort of measurements as well. Um, one thing about this mission is it's only solar powered, unlike their previous missions, which were also typical of US missions where you have radioisotope um, for power generation and heat generation. So they have to complete their mission before the lunar night. I think they, they gave themselves two days. I'm sure they had more time than that. But in any case, they had to complete it. They couldn't, go, they couldn't survive the lunar night. So the ascender, you know, anyway, they got their samples, they sealed them up in the uh, storage device. They launched back from the moon on December 3rd and six minutes later, they're in orbit around the moon. And then the next step is docking with the, uh, the Earth return craft, that's the orbiter. That was done on December 5th. They transferred the samples. Um, they then actually jettisoned the ascender. They deorbited it and let it crash into the moon. So where we are right now is actually, I guess that's today, they should be firing the engines to leave moon orbit. Um, what will happen is it will come back toward Earth. They will detach that small sample return capsule, capsule send it down into the atmosphere, and ultimately, but by parachute, it will drop it into uh, Inner Mongolia on December 16th. So in a few more days, we should have these samples back. And uh, again, the first that we've had in a long time from the moon. Taking a step back, looking at the overall lunar exploration program, CLEP, where have they come from and where are they going? Well, phase one, it goes back to actually 2007, just reaching lunar orbit. The next phase was landing and roving on the moon. So the, the third probe went out in 2013 on the near side of the moon. And most people probably heard about the fourth one going to the far side of the moon. So they actually landed as a soft landing. Uh, they put out rovers roving around in the case of both of those, three and four. Um, and along the way, they also had to put a communication satellite in lunar orbit. Uh, that had a view of the backside of the moon. So phase three is where we are right now. They're collecting the samples and returning to Earth. And they, they actually had scheduled two of those in case number five failed, they had number six behind it. But since it looks like five is a success, uh, six is now expected to go to the South Pole, uh, lunar South Pole. So what's coming? Well, phase four would be a robotic station near the lunar South Pole, and that'd be within a decade. I haven't seen an exact date on that. I'm not sure they have one. Uh, looking a little further, they've talked about a crude lunar landing in the 2030s and um, you know, possible human outpost also near the lunar south pole to follow that. And you know, they imagine some kind of earth moon economic zone. That's all pretty fuzzy at this point. But anyway, in any case, they are thinking for the future as continuing to develop um, basically uh, a presence on the moon. Now, looking at it really long term, I think the interesting thing was a quote from the head of their lunar exploration program. And it's really kind of saying, well, what is Chinese strategy at this point? And they compared the universe to an ocean and they compared the moon and Mars to several islands and saying, oh, if we don't go there, even though we're capable, then we will be blamed. But I think that the key thing is really the next part of that is if others go there, then they will take over and you won't be able to go even if you don't want to. This is reason enough. And I think we should probably take this one to heart. In fact, that's probably not a bad one uh, for us kind of ties in um, a little bit with what Nathan was saying earlier, because what are these islands they're referring to here? Well, one of them is uh, this Daoyu Island. That's actually also called by Japan the Senkaku Islands. That's disputed between Japan, Taiwan, and, and China. Um, 
that one's actually fairly close to China, so it's, it's pretty debatable. It's, all, it's also close to a string of islands that the Japanese have long owned. So it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a legitimate dispute. The, um, this other one, though, is also known as Scarborough Shoal. This is the one that uh, is much, much closer to the Philippines, you look at it on the map here. And the basic strategy has been essentially seize the island, you know, maintain a naval presence, maintain an air, basically say that you control the air and sea space around it and demand that people, uh, you know, get permission for you to go there. And that's kind of where we are with that right now. So thinking about that, imagine they're pretty much planning on applying the same philosophy. They want to be the ones that go there and give permission to others to be there. And clearly they're thinking about the moon the same way and Mars. So we, I think we probably need to keep that in mind. Okay, um, on a separate note, um, asteroids. Now we talked quite a bit about this in the last meeting. <clears throat> this is really just an update because we had mentioned that there is this Japanese probe, the Hayabusa 2, which is coming back from sampling an asteroid, um, 100 milligrams. And it's coming, you know, we said it was coming back in December and sure enough, it did. And this is the one where they had gone out to this asteroid. They had dropped several um, robotic rovers. They'd even also used explosive. They blasted out a 60 foot crater so they could get at, you know, some of the underlying material and, you know, get a, a lot of different kinds of samples. Anyway, it departed this asteroid called Ryugu um, in November of 2019. And now it has returned. They actually returned by capsule um, to the Australian outback. What's interesting is actually there's still plenty of fuel left in the parent craft. Um, they're going on to other asteroids and they're going to visit, they're going to really just fly by one pretty fast in 2026 and spend a lot more time than one in 2031. So as long as the thing holds up, um, they're going to be doing more work. Um, Hayabusa, by the way, stands for Peregrine Falcon in Japanese, or it means that. It, there's, I think there's also, a, there might be a motorbike with that same name from Suzuki or somebody. It, it, the reason is it symbolizes speed and strength. So this is what it looked like. The, um, the solar panels, obviously, and then they, uh, they also had an ion engine that showed here. It's kind of an arc uh, rendering of the thing. And this, of course, was the asteroid to visit called Yugu, which they named, actually, that was named after an old Japanese uh, folklore of an undersea palace of some sort or another. So some other things going on, um, the Arecibo Observatory, this is the one at Puerto Rico, it collapsed. And this has been kind of a, a slow motion collapse. Um, but to ba for background on this, for people who aren't familiar with it, this is a huge um, radio telescope, a thousand foot reflecting dish. You can see that in the lower portion of this picture. This picture was taken before any of the collapse events. Um, it was the world's second largest radio telescope. The largest in fact was in China, or still is in China. Um, on the other hand, it was the most powerful radar, radar observatory. It had the most powerful transmitter and the, uh, the most sensitive receiver. So it was in particular, the, it was particularly useful for really deep space kind of uh, studies. It was built back in 1963. It's been in a lot of movies, including Contact, uh, GoldenEye, and I think a few others as well. Um, so what actually happened? Well, you can see there, you know, you have the dish down below and you have all the equipment up above um, on a suspended platform. That thing weighs 900 tons and it crashed into that dish 450 feet below it over a series of uh, mishaps. First, the first cable snap on August 10th, then another one broke on November 6th. At that point, NSF, the National Science Foundation, the, they, they're the ones who own and run the facility. They had decided the whole thing was too unsafe. They couldn't even really get people up there to repair it because it was in danger of further collapsing. And in fact, it finally did collapse uh, recently here. So December 1st was the final collapse. This thing was ruined. Luckily, there were no injuries. That's pretty amazing. They had pretty much, after the first cable started snapping, they, they kept people away from it. Um, the final future is not completely determined. It doesn't seem likely that this will be rebuilt as is, but um, it remains to be seen what will remain and what won't. Um, some other news going on uh, with SpaceX. Um, their Starship, of course, is their, you know, their, their large scale thing they want to go to Mars in. And the, you know, they have these series of prototypes that they kind of follow a software development kind of mentality where you have very, very fast cycles of tests. Uh, you know, you learn stuff and you modify and you do it quickly. And there are, this is serial number eight, SN8. This is the eighth of their series. This is the first of their iterations that included three Raptor engines. Uh, they only had one in the previous ones. This one also had a nose cone. The others didn't. They, they look like flying silos. And it had flaps for the, you know, 
air control surfaces. Um, and a side note, we probably had mentioned these engines that we're using, they're double the thrust of the, the ones used in the Falcon 9, which is kind of the workhorse, the most popular, really probably at this point, the most popular rocket being used uh, in routine use. Um, so what did they do? They did a seven minute flight to and from uh, 12 and a half kilometers. That's about 41,000 feet. And a lot of people went down to South Texas to see this. They did the launch. That's the, the first part right here. They get up in the air. They do a, what they call the belly flop. They flip over 90 degrees because they want to be able to glide down horizontally on a return mission. They want to spread, I presume it's to spread the heat and stresses out uh, as much as possible. So they're essentially gliding down horizontally. Um, and then at the very end, you flip the vertical as they did there. And unfortunately at the end there, they, they, they landed too fast. Um, everything was perfect except they just landed too fast. Um, so what they said is they really accomplished most of their goals except for the, that crash at the end. And it turned out the cause was luckily not in the engines. It was just that something went wrong with the, uh, there was low pressure in, in the fuel tanks that are in the nose cone. And they just weren't getting enough fuel to those engines, so they just couldn't stop fast enough. But the whole thing worked, including all those maneuvers. Everything worked out quite nicely. The next prototype is practically done, SN9. So Elon Musk, of course, he's always good for quotes on these kinds of things. And he's, he was saying how, wow, we were controlling all the way to putting the crater in the right spot. That was epic. So, you know, and that's pretty much the way they look at it. These are just tests. If you're not breaking a few things here and there, you're probably not testing hard enough. And his final thing, of course, is Mars, here we come. So, you know, if, if you just watch the uh, the evening news on a major network, you probably only saw this last picture at the bottom here, the explosion. But really, there's a whole story there that, in fact, none of this had, had been done with Starship before. And it was only the very last step where they weren't getting fast enough fuel flow that led to that crash. So they consider that overall a success. A um, little bit of an uplink, uh, update on Starlink. We've talked about that quite a few times. This is their um, satellite-based internet service. Um, one new thing about this is that they did get a grant from the FCC. The FCC has been looking to subsidize internet service providers to get rural homes and businesses set up. Um, and, and SpaceX is being allowed to get some money for that, $886 million for 640 rural homes and businesses. Um, that's out of a total program of about 9.2 billion. So that says that they got about 10% of this. Um, there were others, there were, they, I think they maybe had the second biggest grant so then, and a lot of smaller companies got it as well. But at least they got in on this, so they're, they're continuing their ability to uh, get funding. Um, some miscellaneous news, there's a, a smaller company called Relativity Space that's kind of interesting. They just happened to raise a bunch of money they are actually now the second most valuable private space company that's backed by venture capital um, after SpaceX. This doesn't come Blue Origin because that's just funded solely by Jeff Bezos. But their specialty is making giant 3D printers. They actually make the printers and they're making them so big, they're making the rocket engines. And in fact, they really want to make pretty much the entire rocket. So they're, that's, what's, that's their unique selling point and that's why their value is so high. They haven't flown uh, anything yet as far as I know. Okay, now we're at that point of the meeting where we ask, uh, how many launches have we had? And everybody takes a guess. Um, basically, oh, one, well, one thing to keep in mind is we actually had an extra week between the last meeting yeah, and now. Right. So it, oh, you're, you're giving it away. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, you can't really count the, uh, the Starship test because that was suborbital. We, ha we have to have some kind of rules for deciding how, what counts and what doesn't. The crashing didn't disqualify it. Um, it's the fact that it, it didn't actually attempt to go to orbit or, you know, orbit or beyond. Okay, everybody gotten their votes in here? All right, well, let's see. I'll close that out. Share results. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Can I just close this window then? Okay, well, let's take a look. Well, here's the first clue. I finally had to split the slide up into two parts. So there, there's 10 shown here and another six over here. So the total is 16. And I, I don't think anybody guessed quite that many. But then again, you know, this was an extra week compared to the last time. I'll just highlight a few of the things here. Um, <laughs> one of these was a Chinese private company. It was a brand new uh, new company that nobody had ever heard of before. They launched just a really tiny little satellite. At least they announced their presence. Um, some of the interesting ones, though, of course, the uh, 
the big one for us was uh, we took four astronauts to the space station uh, on the Falcon 9. This is, we said the end of the era occurred. Well, now we also have, you know, the new era really beginning with actually sending astronauts up there. And, um, and another interesting one was the European Space Agency it's had a lot of trouble with their Vega rocket. Uh, they had a fail. It turned out they had diagnosed it as a problem that somebody misconnected a couple of cables so that when they tried to control the thing, the engine nozzles turned the wrong direction. So one little cable misconnection basically led to losing $400 million in communications and research satellites, uh, French and Spanish. Um, the other kind of interesting one here is Electron, which is started off in New Zealand. It's actually a U.S. company at this point. Um, they put up 30 small satellites to low Earth orbit, but there are kind of there's several interesting things about this particular launch. First one is that they now have recovered the first stage um, by parachute. It splashed down to the ocean, but it had a parachute to soften it so that they could fully recover the thing. That was the first time they've tried that. Their goal is to eventually recover it well with helicopters and nets. But they want to make sure that the, the things actually survive that. So it looks like that, that was a good test and it turned out it worked out pretty well. Uh, a second interesting thing about this particular launch is they launched 24 communication satellites um, called Space Bees. You know, we've been thinking about satellites being small when they get down to the CubeSat size, which are multiples of four inch cubes. These things are the size of a slice of bread. And they're actually planning on using these as communication satellites. Um, they're apparently low data rate. They, might, they have to be because they just can't have that much power when they have that much size. But they have a lot of them. I mean, the, the company is called Swarm or something. Um, so they're planning on having a lot of these things. Um, the third thing that's an interesting one is there is a, uh, a little device called a drag racer they're testing out by a company called Millennium Space Systems. It's actually got bought out by Boeing. A little device about two pounds that you can tack onto a satellite. And what it is, is it's a, in this particular case, it's, it's a tether. Um, it basically, it's a thin tape, about two inches wide, 230 feet long. The idea is when you come to the end of life for um, a low Earth orbit satellite, you unspool the tape. And that adds so much uh, drag that it actually speeds up the orbiting. So they should reorbit in about 45 days. So they're doing an, actually a controlled test. They have two satellites that are otherwise identical. Um, one of them has the tether, one of them doesn't. They expect the, uh, you know, the, the normal one to last seven years, which would be pretty typical for, for a low Earth orbit satellite. Um, and they expect 45 days for the one that dragged the tape. So this is viewed as a way to help keep, you know, low Earth orbit area much cleaner rather than having a whole lot of junk just floating around up there. Um, let's see, another interesting one. Nothing much there. Starlink continues the launch, another 60 satellites. Um, UAE is kind of interesting that they, they actually need a military surveillance satellite. I guess pretty interesting. They're willing to fund these kind of things. Um, another interesting one is the Falcon 9 resupply of cargo. We mentioned getting there with crew, but they're also sending up uh, the cargo dragon capsules. This is a new version. It's bigger. At least it has more volume. It does happen to include the Bishop Airlock. Now that, for those of you who been in this group for a while, we actually toured the Nanorax facility and got a chance to see this thing and touch it. So we can actually say that we've actually touched something that is now up in the space station. What it's there for is to enable a lot more experiments. Basically, it just so it has a lot more places where you can take stuff in and out of the space station, expose it to space, or even launch small satellites. Um, many, many, many more. That's actually, that ability to access space, strangely enough, has been a limitation on the space station as it is. So. The, the ability to do more research on ISS is a, a big plus for this. And, and there are some examples of science experiments that are included. Um, one I found kind of interesting is there's an experiment called bioasteroid, where they're actually looking at using micro, microorganisms for biomining of materials. This is similar, this follows up a previous one um, where they were looking at extracting metals from the basalt rock, which they'd find on the moon or Mars. So. This turns out it's not it's not actually as crazy as it sounds. It's obviously slower than your typical chemical methods, but on the other hand, it doesn't require anywhere near as many consumables. It's a lot more ecologically sound. Um, that's the case on Earth, but it's especially important up in space where you just don't have consumables to, to deal. You know, you don't have them, so you you have to find some ways to do your mining. Um, you know, and microorganisms may be the way to do it. Um, actually, historically, the geological record of Earth says that. You look at a lot of deposits on Earth, you, you notice that things like iron and copper are concentrated in areas on Earth. Well, the reason for that actually goes back to ancient microorganisms. So there's, there's really a long history of 
essentially <laughs> mining in one form or another being done by uh, living things. And this is just a, an experiment to, to try to learn about more, more about how to do that. Um, this one last satellite here, Delta IV Heavy, this was a huge uh, spy satellite. Uh, this one had been, it must have been rescheduled about eight times. They typically get within you know three or four seconds of taking off and then something will go wrong and they'd have to wait. Or then they had some weather delays. That thing finally got going. Okay, uh, maybe we should open up uh, uh, okay. to some questions and comments uh, yeah. before moving on. Since I have a it looks question. like, yeah, yeah. Hi, Greg. Uh, my question is: Did the explosive blast on the asteroid Ryuga significant significantly change its trajectory? Uh, I don't think so. I think that it, that that thing was actually that's like a half a mile wide thing, and I think they used something more the size of a bullet. So you know. It, it, it blasted a 60 foot crater, but the, those things are typically pretty soft. So I, I don't think it significantly changed it. Thank you. A question. Um, who has the rights uh, for the moon? I mean, if uh, anybody can just land on the moon, do you have to have a permit to get there? And if uh, you're going to mine the moon, who has the right uh, for the profit? Yeah, that's that's been a, a big area of, of, of interest lately. And there's 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 right now there's two treaties involved in this. One is the General Outer Space Treaty, which the United States and most other countries did sign, and that says that you can't have national sovereignty, but it doesn't necessarily prohibit uh, people from doing things like mining. There was a second um, treaty that was signed called it was a, a Moon Treaty or Lunar Treaty, you know, something with a name like that. Um, that actually says that the moon is a common, common heritage of mankind or something, and essentially would require that some international organization control all that, control all the building and the resources and everything. Um, none of the majors, most of the major space powers did not sign that. So the US did not sign it, China did not sign it. Um, India may have and France may have, but the others, none of the others did. Um, because basically they were afraid that what was gonna happen was the private enterprise would be essentially locked out. And so what, what now happened is there's a third set of uh, agreements called the Artemis Accords, which are um, sponsored by NASA right now. And that's in use um, for anybody who's going in with the US, the US partners um, in that it, it basically explicitly says that, yeah, no, no nation can claim sovereignty, however, uh, private companies can extract, uh, you know, minerals or what you know or whatever, and, and sell the products. They simply can't own the land, and so th they say it's basically pretty much consistent with the, uh, the limitations of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, there's some arguing going on over that. Um, so the, the the long answer there is yes and no. There are some treaties that, there, that may impact it, but none none that have been signed by most of the major space powers, other than the very general one, which just says that, that, that no nation can have sovereignty over an area. I, I've heard some people say that it's kind of like uh, fishing in international waters. Uh, nobody actually owns the, the waters, but once you like take the fish and put on top of you know the boat, now those fish are yours uh, to do what you want to yeah. with. Yeah. And I have another question. If uh, through mining the moon, can that cause any issues that uh, change the orbit or the, I don't know, that, that can affect the Earth? It would, it would take an awful lot of mining to have any impact just because of the mass is so huge. I mean, I, I've got to go with no on that one. I, I personally <laughs> like to go with, uh, let's find out. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, that, this is a problem I'd love to have. Yeah, you know, to, to get to the point where we have to really seriously ask that question, because it, you know the results actually will matter. Uh, we're not at that point. Also depends on whether the materials that are mined leave the moon or not, or how much of oh, them yeah. leave the moon and how much are used on the moon. Yeah. Well, presumably a lot of them would leave the moon uh, once once you've set up your basic facilities, but. You know, still that that volume has got to be so small compared to the mass of the moon. Oh yeah, yeah. But the facilities well, could be anyway, the facilities could be built from a lot of the materials that could be mined there. So 
that could still constitute a large amount of the total percentage of mass mined. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's an interesting question. So, well, if you remember the old Robert Heinlein uh, uh, story, where uh, they simply used their catapults to, uh, instead of sending stuff back to the Earth uh, as a weapon. Yeah. So, yeah. Now that might change trajectories. I think that was uh, the moon is a harsh mistress, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's correct. Uh, I wanted to add that if you want to uh, kind of learn more about it, uh, University of Houston and uh, International Space University in Vienna, these are the two universities who are actually involved in space law. And there are professors in both universities that they are involved in writing this law. And um, so you can check the somehow the latest news about these uh, stuff in these two universities. Yeah, since yeah, we're actually Nathan had gotten uh, one of the one of the professors there to, to give a talk on space law. This is what yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I I was a space architecture student at UH, and you know, we had speakers from there too. So so far, yeah, as you said, no one has signed anything, and there are different laws for mining and using it over there, or mining and bring it to Earth or somewhere else. So these are two different laws. Hey, this is Keith. I have a question for Nathan real quick. Hey, Keith. Yeah. Do you still have contact with the uh, guy who did our space law uh, presentation a year or so ago? I do. Uh, Nathan Johnson, incidentally, is his name. Uh, but I also have contacts over at ESA who uh, focus on space laws that I interviewed for my project, uh, Countdown to the Moon. So while we're meeting virtually, maybe we should have one of them come in the early part of the year. Yeah, yeah. If you're running out of ideas for uh, meetings, I'll be glad to have a uh, update on what has changed in space law since we last spoke. Oh, that'd be great. Are you... Another interesting meeting. Oh, that'd so be another awesome. Another interesting thing is NASA's uh, contract to purchase lunar regolith from one of the lunar landing companies or a couple of the lunar land, two or three of them, I guess. Aston was one, I know that. Yeah, they're basically trying to set a precedent. So saying that, you know, this is normal business now. That well, uh, you, can, how, you can buy and sell things produced from the moon. That's how a lot of legal stuff is and policy stuff is done by setting precedents. Yeah. And, you know, what a great situation to be in to be able to sell a contract on a futures market to fund your trip to the moon to actually go get the stuff. You know, I kind of already pre-sell it. Well, one thing I hope everybody here has figured out if they're getting bombarded with uh, emails or, you know, offers to uh, buy a, to buy a little patch of land on Mars, I think you can pretty safely say that this is a scam, yes. or at least it's it's a, it's a fun way for somebody to make some money. Let's put it that way. Buy a National Space Society a membership instead. Yeah, that's right. That's a much better investment. Well, uh, good deal. There'll be more time for uh, questions and answers and comments and discussion at the end. Um, Eagle, you want to go ahead and uh, take it away? I guess uh, maybe before that, uh, you should, I'll let you introduce them. I'll go ahead and give the, the quick intro for him. So um, um, Eagle is a retired aerospace engineer and ships officer who has designed, built, and test flown his own home-built aircraft. And that includes, you know, propeller sort of planes as well as gliders. And he was involved in design and building of high-performance aircraft. Um, you know, including things like the SR-71 and, and some satellites as well. Um, he's the originator of the, uh, the non-rotating skyhook, which is, I'm sure, would be the main point of his discussion. Um, he has a book called Opening the High Frontier. His main goal is to make spaceflight affordable for everyone. He's not talking about the, uh, you know, incremental improvements. He's talking about factors of 100, you know, kinds of numbers. So it should be interesting to hear. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um... My dream is to see a space-faring civilization that includes cities on the moon, on Mars, space colonies, cities on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. I'd like to see human population of 100 billion plus with 90, 95% of them living in space. 
anyway, that's uh, been a vision I've had for a long time. And it all comes down to cost. Um, when I worked in the aerospace business, I did many jobs. One of them was systems analysis. And when you look at the size, everything involved in building a space-bearing civilization, it all comes down to transportation costs. Um, primarily in the beginning, the cost of getting off the earth into orbit. Right now it's $20,000 a pound plus to get into orbit. There's no way in the world you can build a spacefaring civilization for that kind of money. Um, the Apollo project, um, after the development was done, the Saturn V rocket, each flight to the moon cost about $300 million. That was uh, $100 million per person round trip. That's why the Apollo program ended. There was no way to economically justify it. Everything we have done in space since then has had the same problem. How do you get the cost down? Well, I started out, well, I grew up with the space program. I had to get an education on how to uh, design rockets before I could start. But in the early 80s, I started doing design and analysis work on every type of launch vehicle concept I could think of to try and find something that would reduce the costs. And it always came back to the, um, the rocket equation. How many of you are familiar with the rocket equation? Show of hands. Okay, well, you then know that it, depending on the propellant used, a rocket is 85 to 90% propellant when it takes off. Um, space shuttle was about 85, 86%. It had about a 14% um, empty weight if memory serves, and it had about a 1% payload fraction to a 165 kilometer high circular orbit due east. And it carried about a half percent payload fraction to the space station. In other words, it weighed about 5 million pounds at takeoff. It could deliver 50,000 pounds to a low Earth orbit and about 25,000 pounds to the space station. That applies to just about every launch vehicle that's ever been built. Um, Falcon 9 weighs 1.2 million pounds. The takeoff, it delivers approximately 6,000 pounds to the International Space Station. That's half a percent. The, nobody has built the other issue is reusability. Nobody can build at this point a fully reusable launch vehicle. We have the Falcon 9, which is a reusable first stage vehicle. The space shuttle was a reusable upper stage vehicle and a partly reusable first stage. That's the best we can do. Nothing changes that uh, with existing technology. I suppose uh, if we had nuclear rocket motors and we're willing to fly them in the atmosphere, we could improve on it. Um, even air breathing to orbit uh, doesn't really work because the additional weight of the air breathing propulsion system. So how do you reduce the cost to orbit? And again, it comes down to that rocket equation. There are basically three components involved in that. There's the uh, Delta V that the vehicle needs to achieve. There's the ISP, the performance of the rocket motor, and there's the in, empty weight fraction that you can build the launch vehicle with. And as it stands right now, about 1% to low Earth orbit is about the best we can do. Ways to cheat on that are you can go with a really large rocket and you can maybe get the useful uh, payload up to 2%. But again, those aren't things that are going to dramatically reduce the cost. So after years of investigating all this stuff, it came down to the only way to do it with existing technology is to reduce the speed to orbit.
speed to orbit being, there's the speed of orbit, low Earth orbit is 7,800 uh, meters per second. Then there's the gravitational and drag losses. So speed to a low Earth orbit is about 9,100 meters per second. That's why you have the low payload fraction. But the fun thing is if you reduce the velocity to orbit, for example, um, if you air launch at um, with strato launch, so a subsonic air launch, you can reduce the launch to orbit by about 900 meters per second. Oh, well, excuse me, 1100 meters per second. Um, that lets you triple the useful payload fraction to orbit. If those of you want to go over the numbers on that, I can, I have them here. But basically, if you assume the cost of the launch is the same, if you've just tripled your useful payload fraction, you've just cut your cost to orbit by one third. There are other ways to reduce the speed to orbit. Excuse me. There's ground accelerators. They can be a 600 mile an hour ground accelerator. You can have a supersonic ground accelerator. The faster, the better. You can also use supersonic air launch. Uh, the faster, the better. There was even a plan back in the early 60s to put, a, remember the X-15 rocket plane? Everybody familiar with that? They wanted to launch that at Mach 3 from the back of the XB-70. And then they had a small expendable solid propellant rocket on the belly of the X-15. And they were going to put about 60, 70 pounds of payload into orbit for this for a fraction of the cost of the existing launch vehicle. So those are two ways of reducing the um, speed to orbit. The third one is the non-rotating skyhook. The non-rotating rotating skyhook is basically, it's a space station. I don't know how well you can see this. So in this part here in the middle is a, uh, a little space station. Excuse me, get this solar array turned around there. Um, and the long stick here is a cable that uh, vertically oriented. It naturally orients in a vertical position due to a thing called gravity gradient stabilization. The lower end of the cable is moving at less than orbital velocity at its altitude, so it wants to fall. The upper end of the cable is moving at faster than orbital velocity for its altitude, so centripetal force makes it want to hang outward. So the cable becomes like a stiff structure. And the space station can move up and down on that cable, which changes the altitudes of the endpoints. It's the center of gravity of the system that is in orbit. So when you're moving up and down on the cable, it doesn't change the orbit. The center position of the center of gravity changes on the cable, and it's the center of gravity that's in orbit. So if it's in the, the middle position here, the whole thing is the center of gravity and the space station coincide. But for example, if the space station moves up here, the center of gravity is a little bit below the station now because it has to counterbalance the weight of the cable underneath. And the lower end of the cable hangs down closer to the Earth. The advantage of that is that maximizes the velocity reduction at the lower end of the cable. When you go to the other end, center of gravity is about here. So primarily, it's the cable that is moved up. The upper end of the cable is in a much higher orbit. This maximizes the centripetal force and the excess velocity at the upper end. The purpose of all of this is by putting it in this position with the cable hanging lower, the bottom end is at a lower altitude and it is also moving at the slowest possible speed for this length of cable. So a suborbital rocket flying to the bottom can now match speeds 
with the bottom of the sky hook at less than orbital velocity. It flies up on an arc. It, for a moment, it hangs there, then it would keep going down. When it's here, the crane iron comes down, grabs the spacecraft, and it hooks on. When it does that, it lowers the center of gravity of the system, which pulls it into a slightly or lower orbit. You do get that back when the spacecraft leaves, because when it leaves, it doesn't have to do a deorbit burn. It just has to let go. Again, the whole purpose of this is reducing the velocity to orbit. This reduces the propellant fraction of the launch vehicle. Um, depending on how long the cable, the longer the cable, the greater the velocity reduction. The end result is you can end up with a launch vehicle that has, Christ, uh, instead of a half percent useful payload to the space station, you could have a five or a 10% payload fraction going to the bottom of the skyhook. Combine that with total reusability and you can get the cost to orbit down to one one hundredth of what it is today. Um, it's hard to talk about this in many ways because without going into the numbers, uh, if anybody's interested in that, we can go over that. But it allows for a total transformation of how we get into space. It allows for completely reusable rockets. Um, it allows for such large payload frac. I'll give you an example on payload fractions. Um, a long distance airliner has a pay useful payload fraction of about 8%. Well, everybody can afford to fly to Europe. If you get a 10% payload fraction on a launch vehicle going to orbit and have it be fully reusable, you have the potential of getting costs down to that of an airliner. That means every single one of us could go to a spaceport, plop down your debit card or credit card, and buy yourself a ticket. When you have that, building a space during civilization is gonna, it's gonna happen. It doesn't have to be a government program. It's simply gonna happen. At those kind of prices, People can do work in orbit, whether it's making electronics or pharmaceuticals or specialty metals, and make money at it. You get enough people living and working in orbit doing that, it becomes worthwhile going back to the moon for consumables, because even as cheap as this is, it'll still be cheaper to go to the moon to get oxygen and water and that kind of stuff. So now you have, by getting the cost down, we have a natural economic drive to go into space. Um, it all becomes inevitable. Historical examples of that are the great age of discovery. Most of those voyages were commercial ventures. Even if they were funded by the king or the queen, they were still looking to make money. You know, yeah, there was the uh, Spanish going over there and all the raping and pillaging they did for all the gold and the silver and the jewels of the new world. Um, there was the spice trade going into uh, the Far East. They made a lot of money with it. Those were commercial ventures. Um, the nice thing about space is you don't have any, there's nothing, nobody to enslave. There's nobody to be hurt. There is simply extracting metals or solar power for space colonies. But cost, in my mind, is the key driver. Once you have people making money up there, and that will happen with this kind of reduced cost, space happens. Personally, I'd like to see that. At, uh, Nathan was bringing up good reasons for that from the beginning. It's just um, expanding our habitat. Uh, population of 100 billion, 200 billion people will probably be lucky to have a couple of Einsteins or uh, Stephen Hawking's alive at any one time. 
imagine the technological development it might have if you have a whole room full of people like that who can discuss ideas and really push the state of the art forward. Um, the abundance in space is so much that everybody could live as well as we do here in the US. You wouldn't have to have places like Calcutta. Um, anyway, that's in essence what I call a combination launch system. It's a combination of either a ground accelerator or an air launch and a non-rotating skyhook. You can add in additional things to it, such as uh, some sort of air breathing propulsion system. In other words, uh, the launch vehicle part of it could include a rocket ramjet propulsion system. Uh, it could be supersonic ground accelerator launch, supersonic air launch, um, and it flies to a skyhook. The skyhook becoming like the, the main terminal for travel to and from the earth. If you're going up, you go to the bottom of it, you take the elevator up to the upper end and you can get on a spacecraft that when the cable is long enough, the upper end of the skyhook is actually can be moving at escape velocity. So you could literally go to the moon by just dropping off the end of the hook. You wouldn't need a large upper stage. You could have an Apollo command module up there and it would release, it would go to the moon, it would slow down under lunar orbit it would be refueled in lunar orbit with lunar propellant, so it could leave lunar orbit and return to the upper end of the skyhook. It just has a cascade effect every which way you go. Um, that is a combination launch system. Hopefully I've got an idea and I'd like to throw it open for questions. Uh, so I, I guess, um, what's the, What's the shortest uh, tether that we would need to be able to see, to kind of prove the concept? Um, well, I've used 200 kilometers long as my initial design. You could conceivably go shorter for an initial one, but I don't see much point in it. The, 200 kilometer long cable weighs, memory serves about 5,600 kilograms. Um, yeah, 200 kilometer long uh, cable, 5,600 kilogram mass um, would do it. The main, that's probably the cheapest part of the non-rotating skyhook at that length. So there's not really much point in going shorter than that. The main weights are the space station in the center and the ion propulsion system on the space station. Um, the basic skyhook that I worked out the design for, uh, 5,600 for the um, cable, 2,000 kilograms for each endpoint station. Uh, 100,000 kilograms for the space station and 40,000 kilograms for the ion propulsion and power system, which is sized for a flight rate of 12 flights per year. Um, so you can see the main cost is in the space station. Um, if you've looked at the videos that um, I sent you the links to and that you sent out everyone, um, one of those I don't know if you want to call it up. There's one that's about a minute and a half long. Yeah. Do you have Andy we, Nathan? We could uh, show that one. Uh, which one do you want to, the, the Skyhook one? Yeah, the one's about a minute and a half long. Uh, yep. A minute. 40 seconds. Yep. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I had just why I'm bringing that up is um, uh, whenever you have the suborbital uh, craft attached to the the earth facing in and that center of gravity shifts downwards, what kind of stresses is that putting on the tether? Uh, the cable, I designed it for like civil engineering. So I put a safety factor of five on it. Um, and it was designed to allow for a certain amount of um, velocity differential 
when the hookup occurs, but it's well within existing um, graphite fibers, commercially available graphite fibers capabilities. Hmm. Okay, cool. I got this all queued up. So uh, let's give this a go and then we could discuss it some more afterwards. Okay. Can you hear me while I'm talking right now? I can hear you. That's the spacecraft arriving on a suborbital flight path. The high hook, the space station, the upper end, so the cable is attached to the engine down. Now the space station is moving down the cable, and the lower end of the cable is up. So that gives you an idea. All of that was designed pretty in depth uh, for the making of that video. The space station was designed using space station components. Obviously, it's showing a um, Orion spacecraft on it. Um, you could use that particular design was assuming a 200 to 400 kilometer long cable. So it's not long enough that you get escape velocity at the upper end, but it would look pretty much the same for a longer cable. Um, it would give a higher velocity boost at the upper end. And the longer the cable would give a larger velocity reduction for the arriving spacecraft, but they look about the same. I mean, it's one mile of cable versus a hundred miles. It's gonna look pretty much the same. Um, Hopefully it gives an idea of what it might look like there. But, um, the ion propulsion system is on the space station itself because yeah, that's the heaviest part of it. Uh, what kind of challenges do the satellite constellations and just the, how crowded um, the, you know, the orbital environment around the earth is? I mean, it, it yeah. seems like it'd be really difficult to have an unobstructed orbit uh, and that you would need to do some type of kind of maneuvering. Well, again, you will have the propulsion system on the skyhook, so you can maneuver slowly. Uh, when I first conceived this idea back in 1988, they didn't have all these monster constellations up. Um, as these constellations go up, it's potentially does cause a problem. Um, I guess that leads me back to if you look at the development of ocean going ships, you know, when the first um, and the first ships were that we know of, or the oldest ones were about 5,000 years ago in Egypt. There may have been ones prior to that, but uh, they haven't been preserved that we know about them. In any case, uh, there's evidence that the Egyptians, in the first boats, they were sewn together with palm fronds out of 
planks of wood. And the Egyptians um, got about, what was it? About 4,000 years ago, maybe a little longer, they did most of their sailing on the Nile, but they took one apart and they hoofed it across the desert to the Red Sea where they reassembled them. By the way, they found the place where they did that. They, they dug a cage, so they had like a, in a cliff by, right next to the beach. And remains of that activity are still there today. Anyway, they put those boats in the water and they sailed all the way around Africa. It's about 4,000 years ago. So at that point, there weren't too many ships and you just basically went where you wanted to. As time went on, as ship traffic became an issue, they started developing traffic lanes to the point that we have the world we have today, where when you go through the Straits of Gibraltar, there is a traffic zone. The, the Straits of Hormuz, there is a traffic zone for two-way traffic, and it's controlled, and it's the way to keep it safe. I have no doubt that something like that is going to happen with space. We're getting to, you know, we are at the point where like when the Egyptians, you basically, you just threw something up there and there was, that was it, you were it. Um, now we're getting to the point we have traffic issues. So there's going to have to be rules of the road. Um, Oh, another example is aviation. If you're flying an airplane across the country, if you're going east, you're supposed to be, they have what is it, every odd thousand feet is eastbound traffic and every even uh, thousand feet is westbound traffic. So you don't have head on collisions. Um, something like that is gonna have to happen in space. If, um, you have a sky hook in orbit. I'm not clear how, you know, it's now you're getting into the political end of it. It is a solvable problem. Just like channels, shipping channels, uh, or air routes through the air. Um, how that's going to get hashed out, I haven't a clue. But it is resolvable but it's not gonna be a free for all the way it is now. So what's the velocity that you have to reach to get to the bottom of the sky hook with your baseline design? Um, okay, let's see. Okay. The 200 kilometer cable gives a velocity reduction of 260 meters per second at the lower end of the cable when it's configured for an arriving spacecraft. It's not a big reduction, but it actually does increase the um, payload rather significantly. A, um, when you get to the point that you have a 380 kilometer long cable, you get a 505 meter per second reduction. A um, 500 kilometer long cable gives an 814 meter per second reduction. 700 meter long cable gives an 1100 meter per second reduction. Um, if you get up to a um, 1800 kilometer long cable, you get a 2378 meter per second reduction. And it goes up from there. Okay. Um, to give you an example, one of the, well, I, I put all of this stuff in the book that I have, if you, for those who want more detail. If you're using a Titan II, and I just put that in because it's an historic vehicle and the numbers for it are easily available on the internet. It, um, the gross payload to Leo of the Titan II was about 3,600 kilograms. 
That was a Gemini capsule with two astronauts in it. Uh, if you make that into a cargo vehicle, let's see. I'm trying to find, remember if I used a, okay. If you use a 600 mile per hour ground accelerator and a 200 kilometer long skyhook, um, you end up with a, um, where was it here? see where is it okay the payload goes up to the gross payload goes up to 8600 kilograms and then there's other examples in here for different ones and that's just a that's a minimum one so you went from 3600 to 8600 if you convert that into useful payload the at fractions get even better because remember, the spacecraft, counting the weight of the spacecraft is kind of like counting the weight of the delivery truck that brings a parcel to your front door from Amazon. But uh, it actually triples the useful payload. Cable gets longer, it goes up. Ground accelerator speed goes up, the useful fraction goes up. So, yeah, so, so what speed are you actually going at the, the bottom? When you're when you're hooking up, what's the ground speed? I understand uh, the reduction, but what's the actual speed? We're still talking supersonic speeds here. Okay, first off, the lower end of the cable is out of the atmosphere. It's 165 kilometers up. It's just moving at less than orbital velocity for that altitude. So when I said the 200 kilometer long speed of orbit at 165 kilometers up is about 7,800 meters per second. The 200 uh, kilometer long cable uh, is going 260 meters per second less than that. Percentage wise, that might not seem like a lot, but because of the exponential nature of the mass ratio equation, the mass ratio curve is almost vertical at that point. So a very small reduction in velocity actually produces a significant increase in useful payload fraction. Uh, two just... questions. I'm sorry. Um, I have heard about the elevator that they wanted to go to lower orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, would, will that structure will help to build it or is it the... Okay, the space elevator it's not possible to build it with existing materials. Uh, you could call this non-rotating skyhook as a beginner's version of a space elevator because it works on the same principles, but it can be built with existing materials. Okay. Uh, and it reduces cost to orbit. It actually turns out that it's more cost effective than the space elevator. Um, the reason for that has to do with amortization of the investment. The cost of building a 100,000 kilometer long skyhook that goes from the surface of the earth up past geostationary orbit is huge, even with whatever material they eventually come up to build it. Um, as currently, when they were talking about using carbon nanotubes on it, they could just barely do it with theoretical strengths, um, which they didn't even come close to achieving, by the way. And they could only go have one trip up and one down. They could only have one going up or one coming down at a time. And they have a long travel time. So there were only so many trips per year you could make with it. And when you include amortization of the investment, 
it actually ends up being more than a non-rotating sky hook with either an air launch or a ground accelerator launch. Um, but they are very similar. And if ever it gets to the point that there is a material that would make a commercially viable Earth surface, the geostationary or space elevator possible, this would be great learning experience for it. In fact, the way I envision it is you would start out, for example, with this ISS based space station with ion propulsion system, a 200 kilometer long cable. And then as you go through the learning curve of that, you would start lengthening the cable. You would go 300 kilometers long, 400 kilometers long, all you know, on up. And every time you add on to that, you're reducing the cost to orbit that much more, which is increasing the number of people who can afford to use it. And eventually, it'll grow to whatever length that the uh, commercial environment will justify. It, maybe uh, oh, maybe we. Maybe yes. it'd be good to uh, start out building it in geosynchronous orbit over the equator. So eventually you could get from your non-rotating sky hook to your space elevator. Well, that doesn't work because if you only have a 200 kilometer long cable, the, um, you're still going to have to fly almost to geostationary orbit. Uh, you also need to remember that there is an ion propulsion system on it. So as the cable gets longer, you are going to lift the orbit of the space station up because you want to keep the bottom end of the cable uh, at 165 kilometers up. So as the cable gets longer, it will go into a higher and higher orbit. So you can do that way. You just, you start lower and then you move upward as the cable gets longer. And then it'd be cheaper to put the segments into orbit. Uh, that way too. So. Yeah, there's the bootstrap part of it. In other words, if the 200 kilometer long cable increases the payload fraction by three, that reduces your cost to orbit to one third. So now you can launch additional cable segments up using that system. That'll lengthen the cable. That'll increase the speed reduction more. That'll improve the useful payload fraction that much more, and the cost to orbit goes down. So there's this bootstrap building methodology as you get longer. Every increase gets that much more affordable. If you make the ion propulsion system modular, uh, the solar array system modular, you can fly those components up and add them on to it as you lengthen the cable. And yes, the whole thing can grow in an evolutionary manner. And uh, the materials might get uh, cheaper and lighter. Uh, I wouldn't Stronger. be surprised because now there would be a demand that would really be pushing it. Um, right now, the fibers I designed this with were called T1000 fibers. These are made by Torre. It's a Japanese company. And T1000, it sounds for uh, 100,000 uh, pounds per square inch tensile strength of memory serves. And um, it's the strongest. Uh, well, I actually have T1200 now. So, it, but yes, it's um, when I spoke with people at the company a number of years ago, they said that um, it's primarily a process of grading the fibers. They do get stronger ones. They just have to separate out the stronger ones. And uh, there just hasn't been that much of a demand for pushing it beyond what they have done so far. If the demand was there, they could. But again, this initial 200 kilometer long cable, the actual graphite thermoplastic uh, material is what, 5,600 kilograms. So it's not the major cost in the beginning. As the cable gets longer, the cable does become the primary mass of the system. Anybody else? I'm sorry, another question. Uh, now that China created the artificial sun 
and they are uh, using a fusion uh, a fusion plant. Will that help maybe that type of energy to be cheaper to launch something? Well, um, new, are you talking about for electric generate electricity generation or for an actual propulsion system? Pro propulsion system. Uh -huh. Well, okay. I don't know what the weight power to weight ratio of this propulsion system is. If it's low enough that you can make a launch vehicle with it, conceivably with hydrogen fusion, you could make a single stage to orbit launch vehicle that you wouldn't need a sky hook or a ground accelerator or air launching. You could just, it would be like one of those rockets out of a 1950s movie, you know, Abbott and Costello go to Mars where, um, it would have a very low propellant fraction because of the incredibly high performance. To my knowledge, nobody has successfully built such a propulsion system. Number two, any flight vehicle, sooner or later, you're going to have a crash. Airliners crash, cars crash. I mean, everything crashes sooner or later. I don't know if I would like to be living anywhere near a place where there's a crashing hydrogen fusion reactor. Um, and how clean is this reactor? Is it totally non-radioactive? Unlikely. Um, if you include nuclear, if you're willing to fly nukes in the air, which effectively is what you're talking about, then yes, the combination launch system is not necessary. I just never have considered the idea of flying nukes in the atmosphere, whether it's a nuclear powered airplane or a nuclear powered rocket, it's something I really want to be around. Um, so when you say combination launch, you're talking about air launch or some, yeah, some kind of something from the ground? air launching, sky hooks, combination of rocket ramjet propulsion systems. Um, when I was doing all the systems analysis on this, for example, I looked at just, just using air launching. And um, it gives a nice improvement, but it doesn't get the cost down to a point that just everybody can afford to go. I did the same with ground accelerators. The fastest you can re really expect to do reasonably with a ground accelerator is maybe Mach 1.5, 1.6, and that's if you're operating from the top of a 20,000 foot tall mountain because of free steam dynamic pressure. Um, again, it gives a nice reduction in cost but it really doesn't get it down to the point that anybody can afford to go. Um, the reason for that is you're operating in the atmosphere and you, it's better to go high, go fast when you're higher up. Um, the same thing with just a ramjet rocket propulsion system. It reduces the cost to orbit, but it doesn't get it low enough. Um, it's when you start combining them all together that you get it down to airliner flight prices. Am I making sense to all of you? Yeah, it, it makes big sense. The question is still then, why, have, why hasn't somebody bought into doing this yet? I mean, what are, what are, what are the objections? That's a good question. I have asked myself that many, many times. The original... The original idea of a combination launch system was proposed by NASA in the early 60s. It was a X to B, it was a B-70 bomber, it flew at Mach 3, carrying a second generation X-15 aircraft, which had a scramjet rocket on it. So the B-70 would carry it up to Mach 3, where it would launch the, um, the X-15 with the scramjet on 
on it, which you would then take it up to Mach 6, Mach 8, at which point it, they had a small expendable rocket that would launch satellites into orbit. Um, that was the direction that NASA was going when President Kennedy announced the um, Let's Go to the Moon program within a decade. And it was within the within a decade that put the kibosh on the B-70 X-15 project because they didn't think they could do it in time to meet the deadline. So we went with the Saturn V rocket. So uh, essentially uh, we've going... been stuck with rockets ever since. Nobody has gone back to that. Um, I added the non-rotating skyhook to the upper end so you could get a velocity reduction at the upper end of the flight. And um, it turns out that it becomes, as the cable gets longer, it becomes, you get more of a velocity reduction from that than you do from the air launch, supersonic air launch and scramjet combination. But why have, why haven't we gone back to at least the air launching and the, um, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people have asked that question. How many of you work at NASA? Do you have a, how Retired. Are you stuck in rockets? Retired from NASA. Okay. For next generation launch technology program. And my favorite one was uh, the Andrews Griffin, which was an air launch uh, with an upper stage that generated hydrogen after it got airborne because it was too heavy to take all the hydrogen and the oxygen from conventional runways. Yeah, I think that was called uh, LACE, wasn't it? What's that? Liquid air compression. Yeah, yeah, it was a liquid air compression system on the, mm -hmm. the Griffin. It's an interesting concept. I vaguely remember reading studies on that. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was the uh, systems uh, engineer for all the systems other than structure and propulsion for uh, NGLT, including that architecture. Um, that would be another way of, I look at the combination launch system as kind of, uh, you know, you're either adding velocity at the lower end of the flight or you're taking off or adding velocity at the upper end. The non-rotating skyhook is yeah. the best for the upper end. There are multiple mm -hmm. ways, just like the one you mentioned. Why did not NASA go forward with it? Oh, well, the NGLT got cut because of funding we had to get converted over to Constellation so we could do the, the uh, Aries 1 and Aries 5, which became SLS, which is still out there waiting for a main propulsion system test. Yeah, was it 16 years uh, since it was? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, Aries 1 didn't have enough lift to capability to lift the Orion, so it had a negative mass margin to begin with. Jesus. Um, so they, didn't, one... they didn't really consider the vibration of having a solid rocket motor directly underneath the upper stage, coupling the vibe up the stack. So they spent years trying to figure out how to isolate the vibration. <laughs> Well, yeah. uh, one thing I was just noticing is uh, we're coming up uh, to four o'clock and there is uh, a couple of little things I wanted to um, leave some time for at the end. Um, so let me see if we can I get through them and maybe we'll have some uh, time for additional discussion and questions afterwards. So that's OK with you. Sure. So, um, well, the, the first thing I wanted to share with you all was um, uh, we, we took a tour of NanoRacks uh, last January, and uh, Greg was saying that uh, we had actually got to talk, uh, to touch the uh, Bishop uh, airlock. So I, I just thought I'd share this with you. I had it handy. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to take uh, more trips like that as soon as this COVID thing. Of course, it looks like, uh, well, we don't have masks on, but uh, we're pretty um, safe. But um, Dr. Uh, Heather uh, Domjohn, I was wondering if, and now you could talk a little bit about uh, the science fair and the opportunity for us to kind of 
help to increase the pipeline of future scientists, engineers, and uh, people to actually make these dreams come come true. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Nathan. Um, you know, it's a pleasure being able to find um, this uh, North Space Society, and I want to thank uh, one of your uh, members who seems to be regular here is uh, Vito. So Vito, and through the uh, John Delorio Foundation, uh, they participate as a special awarding agency and help to judge um, about what the Science and Engineering Fair of Houston is um, actually going to be celebrating its 62nd uh, annual year in the program. And we are a STEM uh, program that helps sixth through 12th grade students showcase their scientific and engineering research that they have conducted. And this is a regional fair that spans over 23 counties. We bring in about a thousand students and we are having about between seven to 800 uh, industry expert judges to participate. And we normally have this of course face to face. And so because of COVID we have pivoted this program to that of an online virtual program. Uh, we, you know, trying to pivot such an immense type of uh, entity is, takes a lot of um, collaboration by all means and teamwork. So we are um, inviting you as the experts, we have 17 different types of categories in two divisions. One is junior division and one is senior division. And so the only criteria uh, that we have for our judges is that of having a bachelor's degree or that of years of service that equate to that time frame to be able to help judge. So you'd be able to judge in the comfort of your own home uh, working with students. We are having three rounds. The first round is asynchronous where we're asking students to create a, a voiceover PowerPoint presentation about their project. And then um, round two and three is actually going to be a face virtual face-to-face -face type of Zoom setting um, question and answer session. And, uh, you know, it's, it takes a village to support. And we have, I said, two types of judges. We have place award judges and we also have special awarding judges. Um, and uh, Vito, if I could put you on the spot for a moment. Sure. <laughs> if you could kind of maybe speak to just a, a, of your experience at the Science Fair, I sure would appreciate that. Sure, I've been uh, a judge at the Science and Engineering Fair, a science judge since 2013, I think, with John's special award, awarding agency, uh, John and Donna DiOrio, uh, Thinking Out of the Box Foundation. And uh, I've judged for physics and uh, engineering, uh, astronomy, uh, space science, and several other fields. It spans a long spectrum because it's been since like 2013, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward every year. We were very lucky because we, we finished the last one in February of 2020, just before you know the virus hi hiatus uh, struck. So we were very fortunate to have it live back then. But yeah, I agree with Heather. You know, this year for pivoting, uh, I mean, in 2021, pivoting, uh, you know, for just a virtual would be just great. Thank you, Vidi. I appreciate that so much. And, you know, this event was normally a three-day event that included the award ceremony, and now we have extended it to that actually of the month of February, where our judges will be going through different rounds and iterations of conversations with the students. And that's what you see on the screen there is um, that of our, our due dates for our student projects. And, you know, it's, it's important uh, we, like I said, span all the way from Beaumont to Jasper to Clear Lake to that of, oh my gosh, just up <laughs> and all the other directions to the woodlands. Uh, so it's an immense amount of students that we work with. But um, a lot of our focus too is to try to help students um, see who they are as themselves. You know, you start out, Nathan, talking about um, the yesteryear of our astronauts and now what we currently have is the Artemis generation of our 18 astronauts. And so that is our purpose to be able to help our students who are at risk, uh, low socioeconomic. Um, it's been diff very difficult, I can tell you, for this um, season because there are limited resources. Students cannot go out and actually participate in their institutional labs that they may have had. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of creativity. Um, and, and that's what I'd like to thank you for doing that. I do have another um, person here as well by the name of uh, Emma. And uh, I thought 
the best way to be able to hear about this is from a student's perspective. If I could, Nathan, just for a quick moment. Oh, that'd be fantastic. All right, thank you. Um, Emma, if you could please, please. Uh, say a few words about your experience with Science Fair. Yes, hi everyone. I hope you're having a great afternoon. My name is Emma Johnson and I'm a senior in Fort Bend ISD. Um, so I've been doing the regional science fair, actually this is going to be my sixth year competing. Um, so I've been doing the science fair ever since seventh grade and it's get, um, given me so many great opportunities to experience. Of course, starting in seventh grade, I, of course I was nervous because it was a regional fair, but just coming up with the creativity, um, I've done projects from behavioral science to earth-based science to environmental science. So I've been all over the board of science fair, but the place I've really found my niche is kind of earth-based science. And so that's actually what I'm doing this year as well. But with the science fair, you get to learn so many communication skills, um, connections, because you get to talk with industry leaders that normally you don't get to meet in school. And so this gives you great connections for even after you're graduated out of high school into going to college and looking for future careers. Um, and then you also get the experience of chances to get internships, which I have been um, blessed to get. I've actually, for the past few years, been um, an intern at the Houston Museum of Natural Science and Astronomy, um, where I earned an internship through the science fair, actually. So where I got to actually talk about the Apollo missions and also um, some of the, like the zodiac signs, as well as um, I got to lead the um, Apollo celebration um, a few years ago. And so with this, I actually got the opportunity to meet the original mission commander of the Apollo missions. And so we got those connections as well. And I know a lot of the students that I got to meet as well across uh, Houston, um, was able to give me feedback as well as I got to meet new fellow friends that are actually interested in the same career path as I am. And so this science fair just brings students so many opportunities that they normally wouldn't get the chance to. And even with the science fair, um, you get the chance to actually go to the state science fair. And if you're um, lucky enough um, and the judges are impressed, you might get the chance to go to the international science fair where you get to compete for a half a million dollars in scholarships. And so these are opportunities that students might not get the chance to on a normal daily basis. And a lot of students don't know about this as I've been the only one competing at my school for the past four years. And so finally I was able to outreach to other school districts and help bring the science fair to them as well. So it's definitely a great opportunity for y'all to come and connect with these students to help them with their future as well. Thank you so much, Emma. You know, what more can I say? <laughs> oh, no, we would definitely would love the opportunity to partner with you and um, to provide you some more information about the Science and Engineering Fair of Houston and, and how we can help connect if you're interested to be able to, to either work as a judge or to help to volunteer or to either mentor whatever capacity we have different iterations to assist. So thank you so much for this time, Nathan. I appreciate this opportunity. Sure thing. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit more um, kind of uh, specifically uh, what you're looking for. Like if, if uh, somebody wants to volunteer to be a judge, uh, will there be like an orientation and then like how many hour commitment um, are you looking for? And can you talk about that a little bit more? Absolutely. So, you know, we have, have we have 17 different categories of STEM. We have aerospace engineering, we have earth space, we have medicine. So we have the whole gamut. Um, and so the judging that we're looking for is initially is um, like a three hour time frame. Uh, when you sign up. And I could definitely send that, um, Nathan, to you if you'd like to distribute that information. Um, and, and so the judging is uh, started about the, 5th, the 13th of February. Um, we give you about one week for our first round because that's where we're calling through about a thousand students. Uh, this is our first year where we're actually inviting sixth grade students to participate. So we are progressing despite COVID. Um, you know, we, we have to be able to engage our students, both who are moving from elementary to middle school and then of course middle to high school. Um, and, and so then our um, 
leads as we move forward, our judge leads will be that of uh, individuals who are agreeing to take on the second round and then to that third round. The third round actually has about 34 students where we are, it's a grand award judging and that judging is from industry experts from the different fields where our students, we take, um, we would have personally, of course, but now COVID, but what we provide all funding, trips, whatever it is, provisions for students to compete in that international fair. Uh, and, and so we've had a couple of our students in the past won $50,000 scholarships. That's really neat. And in addition to judging, you said uh, you have need for mentors. Yes, we do. We have, uh, you know, our, our season is starting to get a little bit closer because we're getting closer to that uh, time frame. But uh, mentors, not only for this season, but for moving forward. Mentorship means uh, we could have some students who are just asking for a question. Give, give me some guidance. This is what I'm thinking. If you can just have a sounding board, uh, you know, we are very cognizant of your time. And, um, and then there may be some mentors who want to get a little bit more involved to help them in the direction. You know, when you're working with at-risk students who are under-resourced, it does take a little bit more love and hand-holding than it would for a student necessarily who has those resources. So it just depends on where your passion fits, but we can definitely help you in that capacity. And aside from judging and mentorship, are there other areas that you need help on? Great question. Um, well, we also provide summer camps at times, uh, experts, uh, and uh, working with individuals such as yourselves right now who are providing some wonderful presentations. It's always great to be able to interact with them too. Well, awesome. Um, so what's the best way for the next step? Should they just email you or? Um... Yes. They, get, they can definitely email me and, and I can get them that information if they're interested in the judging and please share it with your colleagues as well. Uh, you're able to hear from uh, Vito, you know, if anyone's interested in a, a special awarding agency and uh, what that is, is that that awarding agency has the provisions to make up their own criteria that match their vision and different than that of a judge, place award judge who has a set criteria to work with. Um, so with the John Durlow Foundation, uh, Vito and John are able to go out and say, you know what, I like these students, I like their abstracts, I'm going to interview them, and I'm going to give you them an inspiration, I'll give them some stipends, or give them uh, the opportunity to have LinkedIn accounts, things, you know, it, it runs the gamut. We have another uh, entity like Jacobs, and they give out signed books from the astronauts to the students. So it's, all we're here to do is to be able to be that platform to help students, because we have to garner their interest continuously. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments? It makes me wish. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, it makes me wish I lived in Houston. <laughs> we have plenty of places. Come. I was there last year. I was judging there last year, and I'm a judge this year too, both in plant section. It was really great. I just wanted to encourage everyone to participate this year. At least it's online. You, they're unbelievably inspiring and you can get lots of great ideas out of these projects. You don't believe what you see in the industry section. It is awesome. Oh, about, very bright. Yeah. About five years ago, I uh, met a young lady. She was a high school student. She said she wanted to be a rocket scientist. So I ended up mentoring her and for a summer project we built a effectively a catapult for launching uh, small model rockets, you know, the little Estes rockets. And uh, she ended up getting a Gates scholarship wow. that project. It was incredible. She's a university now. Um, incredibly gratifying. I uh, haven't been able to make any connection here. In, I live in San Diego. Uh, with with an organization or people who are inclined to support something like that. So I haven't been able to find somebody else. It sounds like you would be a great venue to do something like that with. Um, Eagle, uh, one, one point is for this COVID thing, it's actually a really good opportunity. You get to stay in San Diego and help with it in Houston. 
Yes. I, thank you, Nathan. That's exactly what I was going to say is that, you know, we really have no boundaries at this point. We currently do have a couple of judges who are in California who have signed up and uh, in Indiana and as well as on the East Coast. Um, so it's, it's, we're, we're open for experts uh, who would like to be able to assist the students. And, and that's a great thing, right, about COVID. You know, we always say the negative, but what's the great? So this is one of those. You're right. There's, I'm still getting used to, uh, I think this is my third or fourth Zoom conversation here. So I'm, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. It hadn't and, quite sunk in. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, hey, Nathan. You're already an expert. Yes. So you're, you're good to go. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been doing space settlement design competitions virtually since April. Now we've we did uh -huh. the JSC space settlement design competition is a simulation of producing an industry proposal to do like a simulated RFP for uh, high school students set in the future to build a space settlement, it's kind of like Boeing or Rockwell proposing to uh -huh. uh, build a space station uh -huh. years ago. Uh, but we uh, we we've, we've done them now virtually, starting in uh, in um, April with the JSC competition. We've done the international one that's normally at Kennedy Space Center virtually, and we did just last week did the uh, India national competition, and we had volunteers tying in from all over the world, students from all over the world, uh, ran Discord and did all the collaborations. Uh, between uh, volunteers on uh, one server in Discord, students on their own servers for their companies in Discord, and then interactions between students and, and uh, like our, our uh, mentors with the students in a separate server in Discord. It's been working really well. Well, Nick, oh, Heather. Oh, um... yeah, quick question. Would you give my email address to these folks and if they are willing, uh, send me theirs and I will get in touch. Absolutely. Be great. And I'll, yeah. uh, Heather, I'll, I'll send out the information about um, how to get in contact with you and uh, this opportunity. And uh, I, I think we'll meet up uh, a little later this week and try to figure out how to kind of engage um, even the audience that's uh, not quite here. Um, Sounds great. Uh, Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you and, want to get a quick uh, group picture? Um, I do. Yeah, that'd be great. Could we, uh, everybody, uh, just go ahead and um, put your cameras on, and I'll just take a, a quick uh, group picture real quick. Awesome. Uh, I think everybody's smiling. That's a good thing. Um, OK, uh, did I get it? Let me see. Yes, I did. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to say was we do have a couple of people I thought would be cool for them to at least introduce themselves. Uh, Brett, uh, who uh, wrote um, How to Become a Rocket Scientist and is currently working on a uh, children's book called Goodnight Moonbase. Uh, so, uh, Brett, I just wanted to give you a few minutes to introduce yourself. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Yeah, this was great uh, to hear from everyone. Uh, Pretty amazing and the time went fast so glad to be here for it so yeah i'm brett hofstadt and i was fortunate to be interviewed by nathan for his uh, interview a day and until we go to the moon you'll count down to the moon hopefully you all know about that and uh, so i'm scheduled to be your presenter for february right nathan that's right okay so looking forward to that hoping to see you all then and uh, hopefully in january too when i can come back. That'd be awesome. And I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Countdown to the Moon because I actually don't have anybody to interview today. So if I could get a volunteer, that would be really convenient. I've been promoting it. Uh, hopefully, I don't know, did any of my promotions or invitations help you out yet? Uh, not yet. Um, I haven't seen any come through, but um, I, I'll keep an I'll eye have out. To, I'll, I'll keep at it then. Just to let you know, in case uh, you don't, um, back in December 17th, 2019, um, just almost a year ago, I started interviewing a person a day, uh, interviewing people at coffee shops, on the malls, at the stores, to find out if they knew we were going back to the moon, what they thought about it, and they had an interest in going. Uh, since uh, the middle of March, I had to move it online, 
And I originally wanted to avoid space people and, and talk to non-space people, but with COVID, I decided to open up uh, to everybody. And it's been really uh, neat because I've gotten to talk to, uh, I got to talk to Brett. I, that would not have been possible if it was uh, if I had stuck to non-space uh, people. And I talked to Eagle and uh, Vito and uh, 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 my mom, who's there. So I interviewed her too. But uh, and would anybody be uh, willing to um, uh, have like a 15 minute uh, interview after this call uh, for, for my project? Yeah, I've got 15 minutes, not much more, but I can give you 15. Okay, great. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so, and then the other thing is uh, Masa, uh, this is your first time coming and uh, you, I sent out a thing saying, hey, I need help uh, running this club. And uh, you, you um, filled out saying you'd be willing to do everything. And then I was looking at your profile on LinkedIn. I'm like, wow, with uh, your credentials and, and space and research and stuff, uh, uh, it'd be really good to have you as part of this group. So you want to say a little bit about yourself? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Asa Ashwendavadi. And um, my background is architecture. I've studied a bachelor and master's of architecture plus another master is of history of Middle Eastern architecture. And then my third master is from UH uh, space architecture. So I have past, present and future of the architecture in my <laughs> resume. Um, my main focus is this mostly an uh, interaction of human plus architecture in outer space. So I have been working on greenhouse in uh, partial gravity for moon or Mars for about two years now. I have six, seven papers about greenhouse in Mars or Moon. And uh, since June, I worked with Search Plus, Icon, and Big for a project named MM Pact, the first moon base on, um, for the Artemis 4 project. Um, they have released some news, I think, about a month ago, but their main uh, videos and the actual product will be. Uh, get out. I think NASA has told by January. I'm not sure. It's, it would be after uh, the new president show up. So uh, there are lots of details, habitats, landing pads, infrastructures, and so on that we designed in about seven months. So if everything goes well, they are going to start 3D printing uh, some prototypes um, to through the next year. And Let's see what will happen. But currently, till the projects are in the air, I'm looking for new opportunities in other places. And let's see, what, where will I end up? Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, we're past 4 o'clock. So I think um, we'll go ahead and end here, if that's OK with everybody. And then I'll keep Keith around uh, for no more than 15 minutes. Uh, and so anyway, I, I uh, I really appreciate you all coming and uh, hopefully uh, y'all found it as informative, informative and, inspiring and inspiring as, as I did. Well, thank you, Nate. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you all. Thank you, Nathan. It was wonderful. <laughs> yep. Glad to have you. you. Enjoyed right. it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Bye. Happy Hanukkah. Yes. Happy holidays. Happy new space age. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.